Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 33 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Dawn DeSilvia, and the topic of the show is whole life health. Dr. Dawn DeSilvia is a nationally recognized board-certified doctor in family medicine with over 15 years' experience in functional and integrative medicine. In 2000, Dr. DeSilvia's honest approach and ability to speak to all areas of functional and integrative medicine led her to co-create and manage an integrative medical program for the Los Angeles Free Clinic. Dr. DeSilvia soon learned she had an innate ability to create programs and connect people and organizations in meaningful and lasting ways, leading her right into medical school. In 2003, she entered UCLA Medical School, where she continued her passion and commitment for integrating and evolving healthcare. After completing her UCLA residency in 2007, she accepted a faculty position as an associate clinical physician at UCLA Santa Monica Hospital and the UCLA Malibu Family Practice Office. While on staff with UCLA, she studied extensively with the Institute of Functional Medicine, the Academy for the Advancement of Medicine, the American Academy of Ozone Therapy, as well as with many of the leaders in biologic, environmental, and mind-body medicine. Through this self-directed secondary medical residency, she was able to cultivate an understanding of two underlying questions about health, healing, and longevity. Specifically, these are, what is really making us sick and causing inflammation, which we know fosters disease to grow and develop? And what does science, confirmed by direct and reproducible experience, tell us and show us can be done on a root cause level to facilitate and foster health, healing, and longevity. In 2013, Dr. DeSilvia left her position at UCLA as an associate clinical faculty member to form an integrative medical center of her own on the west side of Los Angeles, California, Whole Life Health MD. It is her firm belief that by improving the quality of the questions we ask as doctors, we will obtain more informed and effective interventions, thus decreasing disease risks, improving outcomes, and decreasing healthcare costs for all parties involved. And now my interview with Dr. Dawn DeSilvia. I am excited to have Dawn DeSilvia on the show today. She has been someone that I was introduced to at a Klinghart conference and then later through a mutual friend, Amy Shear, who many listeners will know. I think uh, the idea for this podcast was really exciting to me because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the mental, emotional aspects of recovering health, and that's certainly an important part of recovering from any chronic illness. I titled the name of this episode after her clinic in Los Angeles as she has many leading-edge techniques and technologies that support whole life health. I'm very excited to have her on the show today. Welcome, Dr. Dawn DeSilvia. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here with you, Scott. Thanks so much. Tell us a little bit about how you got interested in functional medicine and how you started working with complex chronic illnesses like Lyme disease and other medical conditions. Yeah, well, I think, you know, my story is not unique to many integrative practitioners. It, It came through the gateway of me going through something myself and experiencing something and and learning about different possibilities for healing. And uh, it really started when I was 17 years old. I grew up in Portland, Oregon on a lake and um, I was in a water skiing accident and my body literally skipped like a rock on the water for (laughs) what felt like a very long time. Um, Could barely get out of bed the next day, went to my primary care doctor and he said, well, you didn't break any bones, but Um, you uh, sustained a lot of musculoskeletal trauma and will probably have back pain for the rest of your life. (laughs) Here's some Advil. (laughs) Wow. And as fate would have it, my uncle at the time was uh, studying to be an acupuncturist and put some needles in me. And within three days, I was pain free and most definitely have not been in pain for, you know, the, the, 
rest of my life. So at that time, I knew that there was, it, you know, it planted the seed that there was definitely more to medicine than I was hearing about in my primary care doctor's office. And then it wasn't until years later, I decided to become a physician myself and was um, at UCLA and, and very interested in building the bridge between integrative medicine, alternative forms of modality, and, and allopathic care, what's, what's being provided in most primary care doctor's offices. And it wasn't, it, it still, it wasn't until really my second year of residency, so four years of medical school and tier, two years of residency that I learned about functional medicine. Up until that point, it was just acupuncture. And this was at a institution like UCLA wow. you know, ten, 10 years ago. And um, so then uh, four and a half years ago, left UCLA, I did my residency and uh, stayed on as attending at UCLA. And then four and a half years ago, left to open my own integrative and functional practice and was really, you know, learning on the line of fire, kind of why are people having these reactions to things that on paper sound, you know, as the right protocol for somebody with IBS or allergies. And, um, and then again, as fate would have it, became uh, familiar with Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. And that really put the, the missing link in for me and being able to really uh, integrate medicine and build the bridge, not only between allopathic medicine and all these different modalities, you know, acupuncture, herbs, homeopathy, energy medicine, um, but then bringing in the science behind how our minds and our emotions really impact us on a cellular level. Yeah, it's amazing. They have that game six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And in this realm, it seems like all roads lead to Dietrich Klinghardt somehow. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. So you talked about a few of the things. What are some of the other tools that you've learned from Dr. Klinghardt's teaching that you incorporate into your practice and the work you do with patients? So one of the one of the big things is the ability to to use the patient's body of wisdom for their own healing. And, and to really listen to the patient and to help the patient start to listen to themselves again because so much of what's happening in, in chronic disease and autoimmune is this, um, you know, this, this feeling of my body's turning on me, it's betraying me, it's, you know, and, and confusion about what is it telling me, what's safe, what's not safe. And, and also a, a deep mistrust of, of the medical system for a lot of these patients that have been told it's just in your head um, and there's no actual physical cause for the why, reason you're feeling the way that you are. So, so that's been a big thing that I learned from him is, is, is that <clears throat> tool that he calls autonomic response testing as a, as a gateway at, to start to teach patients how to trust themselves and the wisdom that their body has for their own healing, and also trust a medical provider to, to really be interested and listen to their body. So we know in autonomic response testing that the system is based on the idea that we do have an energy body or a field that surrounds us. And so I'm interested in your thoughts around how does the field play a role in chronic illness and why is the field important in terms of recovering from a chronic illness? And then how does the focus on the field help to align ourselves more towards healing? Yeah, that's a great question. And so I became very interested also in, in quantum physics and in, in the work of um, Bruce Lipton and uh, Joe Dispanza, their work with, um, so Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Beliefs, um, it's it it's biology of beliefs or molecules of belief. No, I think biology of beliefs. Biology I think that's right. Yeah. And talking about how how our our belief system is really um, uh, can is molecules exist as as chemical mediators and molecules in our body that affects the outcome of a cell. So when you look at the the terrain or the field that both externally we exist in and internally we exist in if you go to quantum physics it says that that matter really comes into existence because of its field because of what it's surrounded by and bruce started doing work in 1970 with stem cells before any you know anybody else was really looking at stem cells and what he discovered is that if you take 
a stem cell, which is a cell that can be, be can become anything. It doesn't have a blueprint yet of what it's going to become. And you put it in a Petri dish with factors for bone, with a terrain or a field or a, an environment for bone, it will become a bone. If you put a stem cell in a Petri dish with factors for muscle, a terrain, an environment, a field, it will become a muscle. So we know this on the physical plane. And we, our bodies are not separate from those laws of physics. So what we surround ourselves with both externally and internally <clears throat> in terms of actual physical matter in our environment and actual toxins that we're exposed to internally or bugs that exist there um, or allergies that we're responding to or our actual molecules of our belief system of how we frame the context that that these bugs are existing in like i loved what you said on the, the lime summit that you know you you can have this inhospitable environment um, and then everyone just sort of moves in for the party like if you have a terrain right. that, that is conducive to these bugs um you know having having um, harmful effects on our biology, um, that is going to play a huge factor. And, and, and before I really believe before we can start to use the physical interventions that may be very, very helpful that we've learned in the realms of, of integrative medicine, um, the terrain has, has, has needs to be hospitable to healing. That makes total sense. So I'm interested then in what are some of the techniques that we can use to upgrade our field, so to speak, and then how do we change our inner landscape? Yeah. So a lot of what I'll talk about what I've been using in the past and then some things that I'm really excited about starting to use that, I, that I'm just learning about. So for years, um, starting with mindfulness and meditation, and, and there's been so much research about um, we can really change the structure of our brain by slowing down, connecting with our breath and becoming mindful and present in the moment. So this can be very challenging for people with chronic disease because our you know brains get on fire because of the bugs and the toxins. So, but it's a process. And so um, I like to use different actual tangible techniques. Rick Hansen is one of my favorite neuroscientists and he wrote a book called Wired for Happiness. And he likes to say um, that the brain is like Teflon to positive experience and Velcro to negative experience. Wow. <laughs> and this is, this, is, this is from an evolutionary standpoint because it was more um, it was it is beneficial for us to remember the poisonous berry or the the dangerous path, and so from an evolutionary perspective, we held on, more and that became more important. And and but our terrain has changed. Our environment has changed from you know many many years ago. But our brain hasn't evolved to function in a way that is recognizing that it is now more beneficial to us to hold on to the positive experiences and to really recognize mm. the good that happens in the world and not just focus on the bad. So he, he has a great exercise that I use and, and teach my patients called, the acronym is HEAL, and it, it is H, have an experience, so that have a positive experience. So either um, instruct the patients to really um, seek out positive experiences, even the, the littlest things like, you know, the grocery store person s smiled at me or said my name, acknowledged who I was, you know, as they were handing me the receipt, something I was, I didn't feel invisible because they said who I was. So the littlest thing that can feel like a positive experience to somebody, recognize that. Recognize that that actually felt good and that you're having this positive experience. And then the E is enhance it. Instead of just going, oh, you know, that wasn't such a big deal. Really sit with it and go, God, that was, you know, I've, I've been feeling invisible all day and all of a sudden somebody actually, this stranger said my name. That was, that was really a nice thing. And really enhance that experience and then the a is absorb it so uh, then this is where i start to teach some of the neuroscience of um of 
being able to <clears throat> recognize that when we integrate and are aware and appreciate positive experiences, that really cha not only changes the structure of our brain and optim aligns it for healing, but it starts to attract more of that same. So it becomes this, this wormhole for more positive experience to come through. So when we start to really absorb mm. a small positive experience, it just it, it creates a space that can grow within us and attract more and more positive experience and ultimately get us out of this sympathetic overdrive that so many of us are running around in all the time and get us into mm. a parasympathetic state where we start to feel safe in the world, we start to feel safe in our bodies. And it's really only there, as, as we know with, with the work in ART, that once we're in that parasympathetic state, then healing can occur. If we're in the fight or flight state, we just, it's the, the tendency to bounce um, even the best healing modalities off of us will, will, can happen. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I like the acronym HEAL. Obviously, that uh, is very apropos for what we're talking about here. So how do we change then our perceptions of our, you mentioned these things, our disease, our toxins, our bugs? How do we change the perception so that we can shift that into more of a positive direction or a positive relationship? How do we shift out of a victim mentality or victim kind of position to more of a hero position as you phrased it in some of our prior conversations? And then how does that facilitate healing? Yeah. So a, a couple of people I want to talk about is, is Joseph Campbell's work and, and the hero's journey. And, and this is where um, I, I start to help patients reframe what's happening to them. And that I, I really believe, and also Einstein said, um, the, how did he say? He said, the single most determinant factor of one's happiness is whether or not you see the universe as friendly or not. So this belief that things really are happening for us. It's not a punishment. It's not... Um, uh, you know, it's in, and in Native American also, they, they see all illness as this gift because they view it as something that's come to the person and the whole tribe to teach them something and to evolve them into something better than where they're at currently. So I think, you know, for some people, and, and a lot of times it can be a really radical belief when you know, you're really sick or you're really in pain to feel like actually this is a gift. This is this has come to teach me something and bring me someplace um, so much better than than where I'm at right now. I just can't see it. And I never would have gone there with without, you know, this illness. And you hear that so many times with people who've recovered and, um, you know, found meaning through their illness that it really it really was a great gift. They just couldn't see it at the time. Yeah, I mean, that was certainly my experience as well. I mean, this, uh, you know, having come through 20 years of Lyme disease and mold illness, there's so many positive things that came out of it. But as you said, trying to uh, recognize those when you're really physically struggling and in pain is difficult. Um, but I think many people certainly have had that experience that once they've gotten through uh, and looking back, uh, they see so many uh, the positive beneficial things that came out as a result of their trials and struggles. Yes, yes. And and so then another tool that I that I use that I've just learned about is um, is Annie Hopper's work and the oh, yes. dynamic neural retraining system, which is I just I'm so excited for some of my patients to start this because one of the things that that happens and I love the way that she describes it is that because of, so it used to be thought that the amygdala, which is our fight or flight center in our brain, um, was could be injured either from genetics or emotional or mental trauma. But what we're really seeing now and learning is it's actually, it's, it's bugs and toxins and there's other type, types of trauma. I actually, I couldn't believe this. Um, when I was looking up some things for, for our talk on Wikipedia, it had a link and a reference that the amygdala can become injured as a result of parasites harboring and living in the amygdala. Wow. And there's been some, so, so, you know, the, the science is really saying, yes, 
it's multifactorial, how we can develop these, these um, areas of brain injury. And then what happens is that we get the, it literally the amygdala whose job is to tell us what is safe and what's not safe and what is medicine and what is poison becomes, um, goes rogue. And it just starts to really um, misperceive things as, as what can really be harmful and what can really be helpful. And this again becomes really challenging then is because there's, there is truth that yes, there's allergens and toxins are bad for biology and, and certain bugs can create a lot of inflammation in our body. But again, it's, it's the, the, um, the level of threat that is activating the amygdala and really causing it to be in this hyperactive state and, and again, not trust anything and react to everything. And so, so Annie was somebody, what's amazing is that she was somebody who, um, you know, was in that state herself. I heard her speak and she said she was homeless, not because she didn't have money, but because there wasn't a building that she could live in that she didn't have some severe physical reaction to. So she started to learn the work with people like Bruce Lipton and, and the, 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 the ability to actually rewire the brain and, and, and down-regulate the amygdala so that it can start to process data more accurately. And so I think it's a, a really valuable system. And I'm I'm really excited about her system as well. I've had a couple of clients over the years that um, were very environmentally sensitive, had the dark glasses, the headphones, the mask, all of that, and started doing that work. And a few months later, came back with none of those things. They were completely fine in the environment. Um, and I would say that most people that commit to doing the work, and it is work because I think it takes about an hour a day to do the work. I don't think I've heard anyone who really did commit the hour a day that didn't see something profound happen. What I see commonly is people are excited about it, but then not always following through with the hour a day. And I think it seems very important to really commit to it and, and do those exercises and activities to make that brain rewiring really happen. Absolutely. You know, neuroscience says what, what fires together wires together. And, and we have, you know, however many years of development of a wiring within our brain and, you know, it's like stroke patients, you know, it really, the, 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 the brain is, has neuroplasticity. We can regrow neurons and, but it, it takes work and it takes that, that commitment. And, and, and I think also that's why it, it's, it's so important. It's, it's great that she has, a uh, um, at home DVDs, but it's, it, it really is so important for patients to have a practitioner that they work with, that they trust that can keep them on track. Because when the brain is on fire, the tendency um, to say it's not working or I'm not getting any better or it's too hard is, you know, it's, it's the nature of our, of our brains to, you know, to, to have that, that default. So to, have, to work with someone that you trust and keep you on track and, and can identify progress to say, okay, I'm going to go back and keep doing it. Yeah, that makes total sense. So let's yeah. talk a little bit more about the shift from victim to hero that you were talking about. And when that shift happens, how does that really activate or mobilize our own healing potential? And what kinds of things in the body actually then start supporting our uh, movement towards health? Yeah. So so what I was just going to say, too, is, is along exactly that line. Once we start to become in, empowered that this is this is not a curse or a punishment, but this is this is part of why I came into existence. This is this is part of my purpose here is to go through this and to learn what lessons I have to learn from this. Um, then the body again can start to align for healing. And one of the big implications, along with Annie's work in retraining the amygdala, is is both when the amygdala gets into um, an intelligent state, the amygdala sends information to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then governs our immune system and our endocrine system. And so when we can start to transmit intelligent data rather than um, <clears throat> harmful data to the, to the hypothalamus, then the, then the whole cascade of healing in the body then starts to 
starts to unwind for us and starts to become, um, it sort of rises up, you know, our cells rise up to meet the messages that we're sending it um, is, is a way that I like to look at it. So let's talk a little bit about identifying with an illness and how do we kind of lose that aspect of our story and remember why we're really here? And then how does that move us towards what we're intended to be? And does over identifying with Lyme disease or whatever it is that you're going through, does that also then make it more challenging for us to move forward? Yeah. And, and I think, again, it's so key to human beings. We, we want to belong. You know, we want to know, we want to have a sense of self-identity. We want to know who we are. And for so many people, um, you know, they either didn't get that growing up or they had, you know, bugs or trauma or toxins or something interfere with that process. So that sense of, sense of self, sense of identity, sense of belonging, sense of having a purpose. You know, there's so, so many people that, you know, don't really that they just feel very lost. And I think that, um, you know, it's, we could have a whole nother discussion about how that's affecting our culture and, and people not having a, a place in society and a purpose and a, and a place in the tribe, you know, they, they can feel invisible or unimportant. So I think it's very, very important to, um, to have a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. But I think that the, the risk and the challenge, um, with our awareness of the bugs and the toxins is that then that becomes the person's identity. They have been, you know, invisible in the medical community or in their family for so long of having these symptoms that don't have any cause and now they have a reason. So it 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 becomes very neat that becomes their meaning and it and it does a great disservice to stay identified to that rather than use the illness and the bugs as a gateway to really understand who they are. It's not the bugs who they are. And it's interesting, you've mentioned the word tribe a couple of times. And I know in uh, Gilbert Renaud's work uh, with total uh, biology and recall healing, he talks about the conflict in Lyme disease being one of not having a clan, which yeah, is an right. interesting uh, connection it. there as well. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about in chronic Lyme disease and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. In those conditions, we know that inflammation is such a core piece of those uh, conditions. And Mary Ackerley talks about brain on fire. You've mentioned that as well. So how do you feel that our environment and our world really contributes to these disease states and making them more severe, people struggling with things like autism and Lyme disease and mold illness and so on. What's really the message that we should take away in terms of how we can really move forward and thrive in the planet that we have around us? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you know, unfortunately, there there's a lot of to be worried and, and scared about in the world right now. There is real danger, you know, there's real danger and there's real um, unfortunate things to say the least that are happening on the planet right now. Um, again, though, to recognize that this is happening for us, all of that's happening is, is not something to stay indoors and to isolate more and to get more afraid of. And, and our, our culture really thrives on that. You know, we'll spend more money and we'll watch TV more instead of going outside if we're scared. You know, if we stay scared and we think that we have to have something to feel safe, then, you know, we, we live in a culture that perpetuates that. And so to, to really recognize, again, the terrain, you know, to, to become very aware of the influences on our nervous system and and recognize yes there are there are harmful things but that is that doesn't mean that and i and i tell my patients this all the time you know uh, some of some of my patients who are really new to this type of medicine and i start talking to them about the bugs and toxins you know they get this worried look of like this is really you know this is, this doesn't bode well and i say no it actually does this you know we it's teaching us how we can live more mindfully on the planet so so it's really about recognizing and being honest with the reality of the terrain and the world that we live in and, and not buying into the fear and, um, 
and and really using it and being able to to soberly see it as medicine and as something that's going to help us evolve ultimately. And in Dr. Klinghart's world, we're both familiar with the Klinghart axiom, and we know the importance of detoxification, the infection piece, and the emotional piece. But a, a big part of what I took out of Dr. Klinghart's work was really uh, the detoxification piece and how important that is, even more so than having a, you know, a war or a battle with the bugs and kind of approaching recovery from that perspective. And certainly heavy metals and pesticides and chemicals and EMFs and all of those things that we're exposed to in our modern world, I think they do play a significant role in a lot of these conditions. And so, you know, being aware of uh, things like detoxification and what are we really doing to support our body from that perspective as well. Back to your comments about the terrain, I mean that certainly plays a role in the terrain also. So it is interesting and I think when you look at a lot of these chronic conditions and how they are exponentially increasing, it seems that many people tie that increase back to the toxicity in our environment. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's double edged, you know, we're, we're living longer than we ever did before. So the, the body is, has more time for injury, but also, you know, the, the, the chemicals and the substances in our environment. I mean, I tell people all the time that our, our immune system is so sophisticated. I mean, its job is to recognize self and not self, you know, it's, its job is to say, this is foreign. I'm not, I'm not sure this is good for me. And from again, from an evolutionary perspective, that served us really well. If we ate a poisonous berry, um, I was just listening to this again on the Lyme Summit, the histamine connection. All of the histamine receptors in our gut served us really well because if we ate something poisonous, it was just going to cause this inflammation, dump a bunch of histamine into our gut, and we were going to get the poison out. And so, but now, you know, we need to we need to start to retrain the histamine reaction because it's it's causing a lot of chronic inflammation, but um, but yeah to 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 be able to recognize that our immune system job is to recognize foreign and so that's why again you know we're seeing so I think like you said seeing seeing so much inflammation and 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 disease rates happening is is because of these toxins that the immune system is recognizing as, as something that it needs to attack. So let's then talk a little about the inflammation piece of it. So the toxicity, the microbes, all of these things leading to inflammation, the histamine piece. So mast cell activation is a topic that I'm just hearing about more and more and, and really very interested in learning more about, but that also has a role in leading to inflammation. So how do we reduce the inflammation with the understanding that the inflammation is really what's creating the majority of our symptoms. And that's one of the things Dr. Klinghart also has said for a long time, you know, the bug maybe is 10% of your symptoms. The, the, the majority of the symptoms are how your immune system is reacting to the bugs and creating inflammation. So how do we approach that inflammation piece? Because it seems like really the, the most important aspect of the physical recovery. It is, it is really important. And I think that there's a lot of, again, a lot of very um, promising and exciting things that are that are starting to happen because both with you know some some subtle things with just we you know a processes of getting the toxins out and re-educating the immune system. So I I use LDA and LDI in my practice, which I, is a is a great way to re-educate the immune system to not get so reactive against things that really aren't inherently that deadly to us. So different tools to actually calm down the inflammatory response or the immune response and get it to start to function um, more intelligently. You know, just basic things like, you know, diet changes. We do need to be eating clean. We can't, you know, we do need to have clean environments, you know, just not putting, being aware of what the toxins are and what the chemicals that make us inflamed are and and just starting with some very simple interventions you know again for patients like a whole anti-inflammatory diet can be very overwhelming so i say pick one thing let's just get rid of sugar you know do everything else but just let's start with one thing to just turn the dial down a little bit um so things like um neural therapy i think can really reset 
the nervous system so that again, it's out of that sympathetic drive and, and not creating all those inflammatory cytokines in the body. Um, yeah, and I, it's interesting too, because I think the inflammation, the amygdala, the pieces that you talked about earlier, I think that certainly plays a significant role in depression and anxiety as well. And it seems that many people um, dealing with something like chronic Lyme, that depression and anxiety can be some of their more significant symptoms, anxiety particularly. And so what I've observed is that as you also can address the inflammation, um, that seems to really help with some of the depression and anxiety issues as well. Yeah, I tell patients all the time, the same chemical environment that exists in our body when we have the flu or have been in a serious car accident is the same chemicals that exist in our body when we're um, anxious or depressed or really scared. So it's these inflammatory cytokines. So however we can come in to downregulate and decrease the inflammation, um, I think is, you know, just exponentially powerful for healing. I'm excited to hear that you're using the low dose immunotherapy. I had Ty Vincent on the podcast recently as well. And mm -hmm. some, some really, you know, nothing works for everyone, but there's some really compelling stories. Um, I've heard some great responses in some kids with pandas, for example, doing the strep mm -hmm. LDI. Um, so I think that uh, certainly is an exciting area that hopefully will continue to benefit people going forward. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. You mentioned gut. So what role does the gut play in regaining health? It's kind of an area that I see people maybe not focusing on as much as maybe it warrants. And then mm -hmm. how does the gut issue lead to confusion within the immune system? How does it lead to the immune system having more of an inability to differentiate between friend versus foe? Yeah. So, you know, that was one of the first things that I learned when I started learning about functional medicine is, is there was a book again, I think in, in the seventies, there's such a lag time between scientific discovery and, and integration into medical care, but the, the gut is the second brain or something like that. And again, it was from a, a neuroscientist, someone doing neurobiology that recognized that we have more serotonin receptors in our gut than we have in our brain. So really started connecting the gut brain access. And so what I think, and, and this, this also is, is very philosophical to me too, in the way that what we ingest is, um, uh, is, is what we're, it creates the building blocks of who we are. So again, the, the thoughts and the, the people and the things that we take in uh, really influence us, but literally what we eat. Um, affects the the lining inside of our gut and what starts to happen is that you know because so many of I mean I think about the diet I grew up on and the things I the things I ate you know just it was probably 95 percent chemicals and I just you know I had no idea but so again the the our our gut is so from an evolutionary perspective has this you know front line of defense to recognize what is foreign and what could be harmful to us. So when we start to ingest things um, from an early age that are that start to create inflammation in the gut and then put on top of that antibiotics, where you know there was a time that you know people and 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 still you know people will be on you know, not, not chronic disease patients, but just for, you know, flu infections, people will get antibiotics and steroids. When I was working at UCLA, it used to drive me crazy. I worked across from an urgent care and the people would go in there with a sore throat and they would come out no matter what they had with a Z pack and a medrill dose pack. When they had a virus, that makes when a lot a of sense, right? So, so let's give you <laughs> antibiotics to not be to reduce your response to the virus, and then steroids to just wipe out your immune system. And you know, God bless, because they heard in a conference that that reduced symptoms, and you know, they they had five minutes to help somebody, and that's what they thought was going to help them. So, but you know, interestingly, no maybe part of that is because antibiotics also are anti-inflammatories. Right. Exactly. And so maybe yeah. that's the, the reason that it seemed to help. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so we get a lot of inflammation in the gut. And so then what, what was once this um, tight barrier and, and really a, a good um, protection for us becomes a very porous like structure 
um, where we just start to take in more and more toxins and then things that are good that aren't inherently bad are just seen as foreign because it's a different shape molecule. Now it's a big molecule getting through instead of a small molecule. And, and so we really do have to, you know, take out what's perpetuating the inflammation in the gut and, and start to heal it, start giving factors back that can, can help heal that. I have an organic avocado and zucchini power shake waiting for me right after this conversation. So. <laughs> so one of, you were mentioning serotonin and one of the things that, that also was interesting to me, and I, I didn't realize this until recently, was that the majority of the melatonin in the body is actually produced in the gut as well. And so, yeah. you know, we know in people with chronic conditions that sleep is such a big factor. So improving the focus on gut, removing uh, foods that were potentially sensitive to working on healing the lining of the gut. Um, I, I like the uh, Zach Bush's work in this area as I well. Do too. I, use, I use Restore a lot. And I, again, not everything is right for everybody, but mm -hmm. you know, the Restore has helped a lot of patients. And, and some of the most interesting things that people will say is my brain turned, like I, I've lost the brain fog. That, that, yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So you, you've gotten around and, and really looked at a lot of different things. And in our earlier conversations, I know you also are uh, exploring Bob Navial's work with the cell yeah. danger response. And so I'm interested. I've had uh, Dr. Neil Nathan on the podcast, and we've talked about that a little bit. And I know um, he's been involved in some of the research that Dr. Navial has been doing as well. But how does that cell danger response model explain chronic illness? And then knowing that suramin, which which is the drug that was used in some of the studies to turn off these purinergic receptors, as I understand. Mm -hmm. um, since that's not available in the U.S., what are some of the things that we can do to turn off this cell danger response? And then how does this ongoing response result in an overgrowth of microbes in the physical body? Yeah, yeah. So when I learned about his work, it, it again was so helpful for patients to understand, oh my gosh, that's why I'm so tired all the time, is that again, you know, the, we're from, from a survivalistic point of the cell, if it feels like it's under threat, it's gonna take all of its energy in the form of ATP made in the mitochondria and, and use it to fight the war. Like it's just, it just wants to live and so it feels like it needs to protect itself. So it's gonna take, steal all of that energy and use it to fight the war. So then it's just not available to people to have the energy to live their lives. Um, so that was a great help to, to explain that process to people. And that's actually what's happening. And so, you know, um, in addition to the things that we talked about earlier about calming down the nervous system and, and really getting the, the parasympathetic nervous system to start to turn on, um, some, some of the other things that I, I'm, I haven't used as much, but I'm excited about learning. Some of my colleagues are working with um, Jerry Tennant's device, the biomodulator, and, um, and using um, sound frequency to, so our, our cells, you know, are a, a, an energy voltage, you know, that it, it requires, you know, about, depending on the type of cell, 70 to 90 millivolts of energy to get toxins out and nutrients in. And when we get sick, that's, that membrane depolarizes and we lose that voltage, we lose that energy to move things across it. And that can keep the cell then feeling threatened and feeling like it's in this danger, dangerous state and, and perpetuating the cell danger response. So I think that some of these things like sound can actually, and, and, and there's been a lot of research and a lot of experiential evidence that shows that, that sound or light or energy waveforms from biomodulator devices can actually repolarize the cell membrane and get that cell danger response to turn off and help the cell feel like it's not under threat anymore. Wow, that will be really amazing, especially because they have now with the metabolomics and things that they're looking at in this cell danger response, and they can look at all the different metabolites that are kind of a fingerprint for certain, let's say, chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's interesting that those factors are different between men and women, from what I understand so far. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see then if some of these uh, biophysics type of treatments can also then shift uh, the results of what they find in some of these, these tests. That's pretty yeah. exciting actually. Yeah, it is. And I'm also wondering if we can get some of the, 
the really smart herbal folks to also start exploring herbal options that maybe can do something in the body similar to what the suramin does. And it was really amazing. I think the latest thing that I had read was that they had taken 10 autistic children, five of them, I believe, were given uh, a single dose of suramin, five of them were not given anything. And out of the five that were given the suramin, they all, I understood, had a pretty significant uh, positive response. But I believe two out of the five became verbal as a result of that trial. Now, it only lasted for about three weeks, but that was with a single dose of suramin. So, I mean, there's some really exciting things here that can happen if that particular medication isn't going to be available available in the U.S. that I'm hoping that other people are exploring other options, whether it's physics-based or herb-based. Um, it's, it's really an exciting time. I agree. I agree. It made me think of a molecule, um, butyrate. So butyrate has been known to help heal the lining of the gut. And But as many of us know, it just tastes and smells terrible. So even in adult patients, it's really hard to get compliance, let alone in kids. And um, there is a company that has now formulated a non-odorous form of butyrate that is um, really having some great success with autistic children. And so, again, I think it's by way of, of starting to heal the lining of the gut, then the, the lipopolysaccharides that go up into the, the liver and systemically and cause all this inflammation from the gut bugs, again, the cell then starts to feel like, I'm not under danger, as much danger anymore, I can calm down. So I, I think, again, it's really incredible that, that they're doing this sort of research where we can start to then apply it to different um, herbal formulas and see if, how that can affect it as well. Now, if I don't ask you the question, I will get a dozen emails asking, where do people find the non-odorous butyrate? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so... Um, he was, and I should have had the name exactly on the tip of my tongue. Maybe we'll... I'll we'll, post it in the show notes. So yeah, we'll post it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, he was the former um, founder of Thorn, and then, um, and then, and is a biochemist himself. And I actually met him at the Environmental Medicine Conference this last year. His name is Al, and I'm, I, his last name begins with a C. And so anyhow, and it's just, um, he's been doing work with Dr. Perlmutter and a lot of different people that have really been seeing these neurologic changes by regular use of the butyrate. So I'll get you the name of him and yeah. the company. It's yeah. exciting. You know, I have to laugh because I remember the bottles of butyrate that I used to get and they definitely smelled, but then they would put one capsule of cherry something in there that was supposed to mask the smell of the rest of the <laughs> but bottle. But it just added insult to injury. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So let's go back for a minute to the limbic brain and talk a little bit about our beliefs and our traumas and our memories and how those things are kind of wired in such that the limbic brain sometimes confuses what is true with what is not true. You talked a little bit about DNRS, but then what are some of the other tools that we can kind of train the brain or train the limbic system to stop that kind of false alarm or over response when a threat really is no longer present or not real. Yeah. So, so again, I, I think that, you know, sound healing, um, even just having, and, and, and back to Rick Hansen's experience, just looking for the good and, and enhancing that so that you can, your, our, our body knows on a really deep level, even when, it gets really confused. You know it feels good. So using that as a gateway and 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 being honest with yourself, not in like, you know, a box of Oreos felt really good at the time or whatever. You know, it it's it's really looking at the whole picture of what what really feels good in my body and and starting to listen to that. And and again, I don't think people can can do it on their own. I have a lot of patients that get into that, oh I'm you know, I'm doing something, but it, it you, I think it, it is so important because, um, because of the ways that the, our blind spots, you know, we, we have blind spots and, and we really, it's so important to find a practitioner, whether it's a body worker, or an acupuncturist or a therapist or a medical doctor, or a nurse practitioner, or anybody, you know, a life coach, whoever it is, find somebody you trust and 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 commit to working with them for a while so that 
you can, um, when, when inevitably we're going to run into our own blind spot and we're, you know, going to tell ourselves something that's not true. And there's a, there's a story that, that I like to tell my patients. It's, um, uh, there's a, a meditation teacher that I love. He's a, a monk called Sonki Rinpoche. And he's just, you, you go in the presence of people like this and, you know, they're just so light and, and playful and yet, have such profound knowledge and he tells the story that when he was uh, he, he grew up initially in one monastery and then moved to another one and when he was a little boy in the first monastery he fell from a tree and he um from then on just was terrified of heights like like beyond comprehension terrified of heights and then when he moved to this other monastery the two temples were bridged by this very, very elevated glass bridge that had this huge cavern underneath it. And he tells the story that that every day, you know, he would tell himself that, you know, my I, I will not fall to my death. I can walk across this bridge. See, look at look at all the tourists walking across the bridge. They're fine. I will be fine too. And he would take one step and and just freeze. He would just he just the 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 terror would would overcome him and he would go back. And so he, he this became his practice. And he said every day I would walk out there and I would put one step. And he said when I started to recognize that my fear was real, I was having this real fear response in my body, but it was not true. Mm. And there's a distinction between those two that, and, and I think that's, then he started to heal and, 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 you know, eventually of course walk across the bridge and, and, you know, he, he, I think it's so um, pertinent to the chronic disease community because yes, these things are real and yes, our brain is, is, is perceiving these things as threat and ultimately not that good for us. But again, the level of threat and, and how it can really hurt us, we, it's probably not as, as true a story as we're experiencing. And so I think that's a, a, a valuable story to remember. It, it's interesting because it reminds me of a, a story about my mom when I was actually a, a child living in Southern California. I was born in Santa Monica oh. and I lived down there until I was about 12 and I lived in an area that was not um, necessarily the safest. And so I remember at night in my bed and the lights from the helicopters would come through the backyard. You know, they were looking for somebody and my mom would always have me recite fear false evidence appearing real <laughs> yeah. and so it's kind of yeah. kind of the same idea it's funny that, it, that popped into my yeah. head when you said yeah. that story so many of us that have been through a chronic illness like lyme disease have really lost our ability to trust that our body can serve us well so how do we shift from that feeling of the internal battle and abandonment um, of our own self to reestablishing that trust and really moving more towards healing. Yeah, and it, and again, I think it's it's with just the single identification of of an experience or something that feels good or healing. And um, neural therapy has been a great tool for that for me to to um, have patients start to have this experience of um, a connection with their body. And um, um, even if it's it's an awareness of, of why you know something happened or why something developed, um, to to really start to f to foster that sense of connection and purpose, and and then again to have to have a single to be able to have a single experience that feels good. And so again, anything that that I can do to help people tune themselves to the good in their lives and whether it's, you know, doing a joint injection and helping alleviate pain, even if it's for a few minutes, um, to, to, to again, uh, marinate in that good experience so that they feel like it's possible. Like, like it's not, you know, I'm not going to be in pain forever. Cause that's the, that's the story that so many people feel because it, it feels so bad. You know, they just feel like it's not, gonna get better and so to have a a single experience and then to be able to really use that experience and and talk to the person about 
this is evidence. This is evidence that your body knows how to heal, that your body can feel good, that your body can be pain free, um, I think is, is, is really, really valuable for people. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about parasympathetic and sympathetic states. So we know that when we have these false alarms, the limbic system, the amygdala, um, those responses really keep us in a sympathetic state. And I would say probably everybody with Lyme disease and everybody with related conditions and illnesses that most of our 24 hours out of the day we're spending in that sympathetic dominant state. So yeah. what are some of the tools, maybe devices, anything that you're familiar with that can help us spend more time in a parasympathetic dominant state, which is really then conducive to supporting healing. Yeah. So, so it's, it's coming up with something, identifying what, what is individual to that person, because for some people sitting and meditating just sends them straight into sympathetic. And so I had a patient say, you know, I don't, I get very anxious when I sit and meditate, but I love to sit in my garden and listen to the birds. So then making that part of her protocol, you know, for 10 minutes a day at increasing increments, <laughs> we will, we will do this. You know, we will, we will do activities that the individual identifies as helping them feel good and safe. And, you know, so for a lot of people, it's movement and activity and nature um, and reading and just really making time because, again, our, our society is so activity driven and, and production driven. And, you know, I do that, you know, I'm always like, I, I need to be doing more and, and, um, but to recognize that absolute importance in, in our healing, both of ourselves and I think the planet, to, to slow down and to put value on idle time, you know, what can be considered idle time. This is great. I'm getting so much out of this. I feel like I need to give you my credit card number at the end of our conversation. <laughs> it's great. So... Uh, so far, I mean, this has been fantastic around the mental, emotional stuff. I mean, it's it's really, really critical. And I think it's an area that people need to explore more to really support and facilitate healing. But I know you also are a fantastic physical intervention practitioner and piggybacking those things on the mental, emotional um, interventions that you use with patients. So from a physical intervention perspective, what are some of the things right now that you're the most excited about? So, so one of the things that I'm really excited about is, is ketone powder. And I had, I had heard about this for a year or so and, you know, the ketogenic diet and I, there's some people that, so, so ketosis is the process of um, when our body goes into a fasting state, it breaks down ketone bodies from fat and uses this for energy sources, particularly for the brain. So there's a lot of research shown that intermittent fasting or extended periods of medically supervised fasting can be very healing and non-inflammatory. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of research even around cancer protocols using this and, and old research looking at uh, decreasing seizures in, in some populations of kids using ketogenic diets. So it's not new science, but it's getting, it's getting more airtime right now. And um, so, but for some people, um, intermittent fasting or extended periods of fasting, and especially if they're in a more toxic state is not the safest thing to start doing. Um, and so ketone powder by a company called Prove It um, formulated, it's a, it's a powder and they're ketone bodies. And it, it seems to be really helping um, the brains of a lot of my patients um, in, in, a, in a couple of different ways. One, um, it, um, I think it's starting to pull some of the mycotoxins out of the brain. And um, so I, I think, again, it's going to be really interesting to do some testing around that. But mycotoxins, of course, are lipophilic. So that's why cholestyramine works so well at getting it out of the body. Um, so the, the, the lipophilic nature of the, the ketone body starts to be able to excrete these toxins out of the body. So I think it's aiding in detoxification. Um, and then it's also by ways that I don't think we're, we're entirely, um, sure of yet, but it's, 
it's decreasing sugar cravings in a lot of my patients. And so um, that is huge because for a lot of people, the bugs really crave sugar. And I know for, for kids, that's a, that's a really hard one for parents to get their kids off of the sugar because the, the bugs and the, you know, it's just the, the state of the gut's just screaming for it. And so to start to be able to do something that actually patients are just kind of effortlessly walking away from sugar um, has been something that's been really exciting for me to see. So with the ketone powder, and it's interesting because that's that's almost uh, in the realm a little bit of Dave Asprey's work with putting the butter in the coffee, and then not only are you getting more of the fats, but also the uh, butyrate, right, <laughs> from, from right. the butter as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit then about most people when they think about ketogenic, they hear, oh my gosh, I have to completely change my diet. Now, with these exogenous ketone powders or exogenous ketone products, how important is it that the diet is also changed or can these still benefit patients even pretty much with their uh, existing fairly healthy diet approach? Yeah, I think that that's been, to me, what's been so impressive about this is that it's benefiting patients. You can take the ketone powder with a meal. You don't, it, you don't have to be on the ketogenic diet per se to benefit from the ketone powder. It's interesting because the one thing I haven't, and I've, I've followed some of this uh, ketone discussion, but I had not heard the connection to potentially helping to detoxify mycotoxins. And yeah. having gone through this, and Dave Asprey has said the same thing, but having gone through Lyme disease myself now for many years, and also mold illness twice, I would contend that the mold illness was more significant than the Lyme disease probably ever was. And so... Yeah. Um, other tools to help support detoxification of these exposures to environmental molds. A lot of times people get out of the environment, but then they still need to do the cholestyramine or other things. And so having something that really potentially helps support that, that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. So very cool. Let's come back to the biomodulator. So Dr. Jerry Tennant, he's in Texas. Um, I have used the biomodulator a little bit over the years and been very interested, especially how you can use it to measure the voltage of your own cells in certain areas of the body and then also use it to upregulate the voltage as well, right? It can also be used as a, a, a therapeutic device. But how does the biomodulator help the body then to tap into the whole stem cell state and how do we use light energy and sound to optimize our healing potential through the production and utilization of stem cells? Yeah, so I think, you know, again, we're just starting to discover the science behind this. And, and so one of my very good friends and colleagues who I met at, a you know, the seven degrees of Dr. Klinghart uh, retreat, Dr. Greg Hyde, is an ENT surgeon and an allergist in Texas and starting to do some work with Dr. Tennant. And um, so, so there's a laser within the biomodulator. And, and so again, it's a, it's a frequency. So one of the studies that, that uh, my friend Greg sent me was these researchers at Harvard were using a laser to stimulate stem cell growth in dentin to regrow teeth. So they showed that, that light waves, lasers of certain frequencies can actually stimulate stem, stem cells. So I, I think, you know, and some of the results that, um, that Dr. Tennant's seeing and Dr. Hyde is seeing is, is really kind of like activation of this, you know, patients will go from pretty severe symptoms before a treatment to complete resolution of symptoms after the treatment. So I, I really do think that the, the lasers and the lights, again, have a, have a frequency that you know, these researchers at Harvard started tapping into that, that can actually stimulate this, this pluripotent potential inside of our cells that can just go from sick to well. 
Thank yeah, you. that's amazing. And one of, one of the areas that I think is still difficult for people that I would love to see new solutions um, arrive around this biophysics kind of tools um, is dealing with dental cavitations, right? I mean, yeah. people still are having to do some of these, and I've done done two cavitations myself, but I mean, those surgical procedures, they're not the worst thing in the world, but they're certainly not something that is enjoyable. No. And, and there aren't I have not really seen any compelling alternatives yet, but I bet when we get five or 10 years down the road, we'll probably be thinking about resolution of cavitations in a completely different way, more along the lines of the tools you're talking about. I think so too. I yeah, think so too. that's amazing. So what do you mean by the saying, your genes are not your destiny? I think this is such an important uh, yeah. thing to understand. Yeah, especially in, you know, the environment right now where we're so fascinated with our genetics and discovering, you know, that what those mean. And, and, and so, but what we know is that that's just, that's just like, um, it, it's like a book, but that book doesn't have any inherent ability to be read by the body, to be opened, to be expressed, unless the things that sit on top of our genes, our epigenetics, tell it to express itself. So if we aren't doing something that is telling our genetic material to get cancer or have allergies or, um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, if we're if we don't have the the, the terrain or the field that uh, encapsulates our genes to express itself, it is not going to tell that story. It's going to tell a different story. So I really, I think that again, it's just science is, it's so inspiring <laughs> to me, the way that it can give us this, this knowledge and this hope that, that we can influence our health on a very, very, uh, powerful level. Well, I think it's even exciting that we can start to learn about how nutrition influences genetic expression in the world of chronic inflammatory response syndrome and Dr. Richie Shoemaker's work. They're really, um, and he's been talking about this for a couple of years, but I'm just starting to see people really look at it where they have the transcriptomics testing and they can look at a whole series of hundreds of different genes that are upregulated in a stress response wow. and then implement VIP nasal spray, the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, which is part of the biotoxin illness protocol from Dr. Shoemaker, and then go back and look at those genes again and see that they're no longer in that stress expressed state. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> it, is, it is really cool stuff. And I think it's things like this that are just going to start to build these bridges. I mean, I, I, I tell people I really think we're in a in a renaissance with with medicine right now because these things that have been you know very um, on you know criticized and 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 you know not valued we now have these tools to to bring merit to them um, so it's really exciting I totally agree mm -hmm. so what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis to optimize your own health you have so many tools at your disposal I can imagine this is going to be interesting <laughs> <laughs> on, on any given evening, my staff walks into my office after clinic and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and she goes again. <laughs> um, but so, you know, but just really simply, I mean, it's it for me, it's, um, you know, movement and being in nature and um, and committing to a, to a mindfulness practice and placing value on I need to I need to sit and focus on my breath and and be still and um watch my thoughts go in and out the stupid ones and the brilliant ones and not become attached to them and 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 really you know that process of becoming familiar with the nature of my mind and i think the nature of the mind and and i think that that for me you know be, becoming a doctor really was and is a spiritual path for me. You know, it's, it's, it's learning, you know, what, what helps heal me and, and how then I can offer that to other people. 
yeah, that, um, that was obvious to me that this is part of your purpose and passion <laughs> on this planet. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. I, I'm interested in actually having you talk a little bit about your practice and if people are interested in working with you, how can they find you? Are you taking new patients? Yes, I am. And, and I work with patients both live and then I do Skype appointments as well. I, I always like for, for people to have someone in their area, but for a lot of people, they they don't know where to start. And so it's a great resource for me to be able to, to start people on the path by working with them via Skype and connecting them. So they can go to my website, which is wholelifehealthmd.com, and it'll have all the information about where to find me uh, live or virtually. That's fantastic. So it's been an interesting conversation, certainly very, very powerful. The concepts of mental, emotional, beyond just the physical, the concepts of physics beyond just chemistry. Um, a lot of these things really resonate with me, certainly in part because of our shared mentor, Dr. Klinghardt, but in part because a lot of these tools have also been tools that have been important for me on my own journey. Um, the exploration into the mental, emotional health, certainly critical parts of my own healing process. I appreciate you so much taking time today to be here. It was absolutely fantastic. And I owe Amy a, a big hug as well for reconnecting us and uh, making this happen today. Thank you uh, for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, the feeling's so mutual, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. To learn more about today's guest, visit wholelifehealthmd.com. That's wholelifehealthmd.com. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcasts series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.